بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today we begin insha'Allah with hadith number 49 It is similar to previous hadiths we discussed and it is related with the times of prayers Mawaqeet As-Salat and hadith number 49 and who would volunteer to read it for us? Yes brother Assalamu alaikum Salam Narrated Sayyar bin Salama I along with my father went to Abu Burza Al-Aslami and my father asked how did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to pray the obligatory prayers Abu Burza said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to offer the Zuhar prayer which you people call the first one at midday as soon as the sun declined the Asr at a time when after the prayer a man might go to the house at the father's place in Al Madina and arrive while the son was still alive. I forgot what he said about the Maghrib prayer. The Prophet loved to delay the Isha, which you call Al Atama, and he disliked sleeping before it and speaking after it. After the Fajr prayer, he used to depart when a man could recognize the one sitting beside him, and he used to recite between 60 to 100 ayat of the Quran in the Fajr prayer. Very well. Again, the hadith is an emphasis to what we have mentioned before and that is the times of prayer are recognized by observing the sun. And in the hadith, what is a little bit different than before is for example, Maghrib. He forgot what Abu Barza, may Allah be pleased with him, said about it. But we know that the time of Maghrib starts when? When the sun sets. So as soon as the sun sets, this is the time of Maghrib. And the Prophet ﷺ used to like to delay the time of Isha. But again, in the previous hadith, we mentioned that it depends on the people. So if the people were present, he would pray Isha after the Adhan. But if they did not come, he would wait and he would wish to postpone it until the third of the day is gone. Or that is, until the third of the night is gone and sometimes close to the middle of the night. However, the Prophet did not do this all the time, والسلام, but he wished that his people, his ummah would postpone it. But knowing that this might burden them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not made it part of uh, the obligatory things. And the last phrase, it says that the Prophet used to, alayhi salatu wasalam, did not recommend, did not like. He disliked sleeping before it and speaking after it. What is it? Salatul Isha. So the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, did not like sleeping before it, meaning between Maghrib and Isha. Why would he not like something like that because it would result that people would stay up late. And this was not his sunnah. His sunnah was to sleep after Isha. And not only that, a nation that sleeps a lot is unproductive. It would not be able to produce. Unfortunately, nowadays in most Muslim countries, when does the day begin? At what time? Here in India, what are the working hours? Eight? At ten. This is extremely late. Because if you work at ten, you will finish probably at six, maybe seven. What remains of the day? The whole day is gone. The Islamic working hours would be after Fajr. And you work up till Dhuhr maybe at one or two o'clock and that is it you utilize the rest of the day for whatever you want to do because there is lost time between fajr and your working hours in arab countries some arab countries start their day at seven some start at eight 
the maximum they would start is at nine from nine till five this is the western way of doing it however this is too late again the prophet's way the prophet sunnah salam, is that after isha you go to bed and mostly they used to wake up in the middle of the night at 12 o'clock at one o'clock and they spend the rest of the time praying from one up till fajr prayer and then they pray fajr and then they go and this is unlike what we're doing nowadays we try to stay as late as possible 1 a.m 2 a.m and we sleep for two three hours go to fajr we don't know what we're reciting in fajr and then we go back to sleep and go to our work so our day is completely out of context we don't have any productivity during the day the prophet ﷺ did not like speaking after isha chit chatting unless it's an emergency or for something that is related to islam or propagating of islam making da'wah calling people or having guests and this is rare it is not the norm if you look at the muslims nowadays after isha what do they do they spend this time in watching movies and listening to music and chit chatting and anything that is not useful for them but this was not the way they used to work all day long and they used to rest and prepare for prayer all night long or most of the night because they knew the reason they were on this earth for and that is to worship Allah Azza wa Jal in Sahih Imam Muslim the Prophet والسلام, once asked his companions after Fajr so Fajr is the beginning of the day so he said who among you is fasting Abu Bakr said I am Prophet of Allah and then the Prophet said who among you has visited a sick person visited someone who is a patient and Abu Bakr said, I am the one, the Prophet of Allah. I did that already. Who followed a funeral until it was buried? Abu Bakr said, I did. Who fed a poor person? And Abu Bakr said, I did. All of these four tasks and it is Fajr prayer. When did he do all of this? Meaning that his night was not spent in sleeping. It was spent in righteous deeds. The Prophet said, والسلام, by Allah these four deeds if they were combined in one day in one person he will be among those who enter jannah so we are wasting our time we are wasting our lives doing things that do not benefit us and that is why we have to try our best to sleep early because the early birds usually get all the barakah the prophet said may allah bless the early times of my ummah. Burika li ummati fi bukuriha. If my ummah start their day early, Allah will bless that for them. So this is a, a part of the Sunnah alayhi salatu wasalam. Also in this hadith, the companion Abu Barza, may Allah be pleased with him, says that the Prophet wasalam, would conclude his Fajr prayer when a person recognizes the one next to him he did not say when the person recognizes everybody meaning it is still dark and this emphasizes the point that we spoke about earlier that the sunnah is to offer fajr prayer when it is dark not to wait until it's light also he says that he used to recite between 60 and 100 verses of the quran so even if he prolonged the prayer, starting at where it's really dark, if he prolongs the prayer until it's light, this is okay. Do you remember what is the name of the darkness? Of Fajr? We mentioned that last time. It's called Ghalas. Ghalas. And to do this action is called Taghlis. And what is the name of praying it when it's about to be light when the whole world is lit but the sun did not rise is far it's called is far 
So this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ regarding these prayer times. Move on to the following hadith, hadith number 50. We have two hadiths here, uh, 50 and 51. We will give it one go, inshallah. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu reported, when it was a day of the battle of Ahzab, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, may Allah fill their graves and houses with fire as they detained us and diverted us from the middle prayer till the sun set. Muslim. <clears throat> Not complete sentence, couldn't find actually. Abdullah bin Masood reported that, radiallahu ta'ala anhu reported that, the polytheists detained the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from observing the afternoon prayer till the sun became red or it became yellow. Upon this, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, they have diverted us <coughs> from offering the middle prayer, that is the Asr prayer. May Allah fill their bellies and their graves with fire. Or he said, may Allah stuff their bellies and their graves with fire. This battle, the battle of Al Ahzab, does it have another name? Anyone? It is Al, Al Khandaq. Al Khandaq, this is correct. And Al Khandaq means the trench. This battle took place in the fifth year of Al Hijra. And this battle was not that. They had a lot of fights and a lot of casualties. On the contrary, it was anticipation. And what importance did this battle have? This is... Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Ghazwatul Ahzab took place on the fifth year of Al Hijra. And as stated, the Prophet was advised والسلام, when he learned that the tribe of Ghatafan joined forces with the pagans of Quraysh and with the Jews of Bani Quraida to attack Islam and annihilate it. So the Prophet was advised والسلام, to build or actually to dig a trench, a big trench, something that the Arabs did not know of. And this would make a natural barrier alongside the hills and the mountains surrounding Medina. This approximately took a number of weeks, a month or so. However, there was not actual fighting except for some skirmishes here and there. Yet the Muslims were afraid as Allah described them in Al-Quran and there is a surah by the name of Al-Ahzab where it describes how the Muslims were afraid and intimidated by the siege of the disbelievers. Now the Prophet والسلام, in this hadith is the first part of it. It says that Ali may Allah be pleased with him said that the Prophet والسلام, said on the day of Al-Khandaq or Al-Ahzab may Allah fill their graves and their houses with fire as they have prevented us from praying Asr on time until the sun set. And he described it as the middle prayer. And people before used to think that Fajr was the middle prayer because Allah says in the Quran, Hafidhu ala salati wa salati al wusta And as salat al wusta by this hadith definitely is Salat Al-Asr. So even though there are scholars that said otherwise, we as Muslims definitely would put aside what the scholars said when we have authentic hadith about the Prophet ﷺ because there are different ways of interpreting the Quran. The best way is to interpret the Quran by, by the Quran itself. Like for example, where Allah Azza wa Jal says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِيمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمِ Those who believe and do not associate their belief with any form of aggression. And the companions came and complained and said, Prophet of Allah, we all have some sort of aggression 
And the Prophet said, no, this is not what was meant. Didn't you read what the righteous man, the pious man, Luqman, what did he say to his son? Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Verily, associating others with Allah is a great transgression. So this is a transgression meant in this ayah. So the Prophet explained this by that. This is the highest level of interpreting the Quran. Likewise, if you do not have a clear interpretation from the Quran, the second level would be interpreting the Quran by the Sunnah, the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Because he is the most knowledgeable of what Allah Azza wa Jal meant. And there are a number of evidences. This is not the time for it. And then the third way of doing it is by learning the interpretation by the companions. And that is why Ibn Abbas, for example, may Allah be pleased with him, is among the best in interpreting the Quran. The famous hadith or narration when Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, used to gather those of knowledge in his gathering, in his court. But he would not allow anyone in. And he used to allow Ibn Abbas. And Ibn Abbas was a young boy. Yani, uh, not a young boy, he was a man uh, in his 20s, early 20s. And the companions complained, saying that we have children, our children, our sons, are older than Ibn Abbas, yet you deprive them from coming and attending your court. Why is that? So he said, I'll, I'll show you. And in his court, he asked companions, companions of the Prophet Umar asked them, what do you know about the surah, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ What do you understand from this? The companions all said that it's obvious. Allah says when you see the victory of Allah Azza wa Jal coming and Allah Azza wa Jal has made you victorious and people are entering in Islam in a lot of numbers in this case praise Allah and ask him for forgiveness because Allah is most forgiving and he accepts the repentance so he nodded his head Ibn Abbas what do you understand from this verse or from this surah Ibn Abbas says this is the tiding to Muhammad والسلام, that he's going to die Allah is informing Muhammad that he is now about to die sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did you understand this? This is how, what he understood. Umar said, by Allah, this is exactly what I understand. Now, Umar understands it because in the beginning he did not. When this surah was revealed to the Prophet sallam, and he told the people after reading it that, oh people, a man, a slave of Allah is been given the choice between this dunya and in what Allah has. And Abu Bakr started to cry and started to weep. And the companions are looking, what is this old man doing? Why is he crying? The Prophet is talking about a slave of Allah and now he's crying. And uh, Abu Bakr says, by Allah, O Prophet of Allah, we give our souls in your protection. Meaning he knew, he understood. That is when Umar radiallahu anhu understood what this chapter means and he came to know this. So, Quran by Quran, Quran by Sunnah, Quran by the companions, and then Quran by the Arabic language. If you fail to find the interpretation of the previous three, then you go to the Arabic language because Quran was revealed in Arabic, it is Arabic, so you can understand it only by Arabic. So, Hafidhu ala salawati wa salati al-wusta. As Salat al Wusta is the middle prayer, which is Al Asr prayer. And the Prophet, as you can see in this hadith, has supplicated against the Kuffar. Nowadays, this is an issue of controversy among a lot of the so called Muslims. They say, don't supplicate against the Kafir, don't supplicate against those who are not Muslims. Why? Because this is not friendly, this is barbaric, this is so and so, no, 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 no. 
Supplication is something that I ask from Allah Azza wa Jal. I'm not holding a gun against you. I'm not doing anything against you. I'm just simply saying, Oh Allah, do this or do that to the disbelievers. Any disbeliever? No, definitely not. It's a form of aggression to supplicate against the Jews and the Christians who do not attack us or who are not enemies. And they are the majority of the Jews and the Christians. But it is permissible for us as Muslims. Not only that, it is recommended for us as Muslims to supplicate against the enemies of Islam. So those who attack Islam, those who ridicule Islam, those who make drawings against the Prophet والسلام, or make fun of our religion or attack our Quran, the simplest thing to do is to raise your hands and ask Allah Azza wa Jal for their destruction. Now if someone comes up and says, no, 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 this is not wise. You should ask Allah for their guidance. This is unacceptable. Those who attack us, we have to defend ourselves. And the least you defend yourself with is making dua. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua and we follow suit. And why didn't the Prophet ﷺ pray on time? Isn't praying on time something essential? Yes, it is essential. However, this hadith was before Allah Azza wa Jal made Salat al-Khawf mandatory. What is Salat al-Khawf? It is the prayer of fear. It's called the prayer of fear. It is when people are at war, people at a state of extreme fear that they're unable to pray the normal prayer. We will come to describe this inshallah later on in this chapter of prayer. But before this was mandated, Al-Khandaq took place. And the Prophet ﷺ was so engaged in anticipating the enemy so that they would not attack them while they were off guard to the extent that he did not pray Asr on time, whether deliberately or he forgot. But it was a situation that he could not pray on time. So this shows you how scary that battle was anticipation awaiting not knowing when an arrow would come not know when their uh, horsemen would ride across that trench and start to attack so it was a very scary situation being surrounded from all directions and that is why the prophet ﷺ missed al asr prayer and as i said because we do not have enough time to elaborate on this, inshallah, next time we meet, we will mention when it is possible for you to make up for the prayers and when it is not possible. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have until we meet next time. Fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.